welcome everybody to this uh, to this webinar um, where we are um, smashing together a couple of concepts today, uh, leveraging your price transparency data uh, and also uh, looking at service line analytics and um, taking separate views of those two things and then uh, and then combining them um, and and optimizing um, you know the the analytics that you can generate um, from from good use of of, of both of these uh, tools and approaches. So very much looking forward to uh, to this um, to this presentation. It's going to be about an hour. Uh, we're going to end our comments um, at about the fifty minute mark. Um, Q and A is more than welcome, uh, guys. Um, and as a matter of fact, you know, as as indicated in the prior comments, uh, please try to use your name to submit questions uh, in case we can't get to everyone. We know how to find you to, to help uh, get a response to your question. So uh, if you could do that, uh, although it's certainly not prohibited from from uh, asking an anonymous question, but uh, just ask for your identity if you if you're comfortable with that. Um, so uh, looking forward to a great presentation. And uh, if we could go to the to the next slide, I will um, uh, just briefly touch on the dynamic team that we have here today. So there's me on the upper left hand corner, David Gregory, partner Baker Tilly in the healthcare consulting practice, um, been in the provider payer and, and life sciences space for more years than I'd like to admit. Um, uh, to my right, Kevin Coonan is a is a new partner uh, and colleague in the uh, in the firm. And Kevin has deep experience. Um, on on the, the payer side of things, which comes in very handy when you talk about this topic. Um, and Heather Herc is a director in our practice and Michelle Ray is a senior manager. Both of them have deep experience. Um, Heather, more on the payer side, Michelle on both sides. Um, and you'll see their, their various perspectives because each of them is gonna have a chance to uh, impart some knowledge um, on, on you guys as we move through the, uh, the presentation. So, um, Next slide. So here's our learning objectives. And then I'm going to get out of the way um, and uh, allow the other experts to uh, uh, to impart the knowledge as I as I indicated. Right. So we are going to, um, you know, provide some tips to you in terms of effective techniques to extract price transparency data um, for competitors and contracted payers. I think, you know, the, the primary use case that I think everybody's aware of and everybody is buzzing about. Um, is using these price transparency files to benchmark yourself for competitive intelligence and, and things of that nature. And that's absolutely uh, an appropriate and popular use case um, you know, for, for this data. It's not easy, uh, and we're going to outline today why it's not uh, and why Baker Tilly can make it easier for you, um, uh, you know, if you so choose. But you know, that's, that's definitely the obvious use case that, that's out there. I grew up in a managed care world where we used to negotiate contract terms as to how proprietary those rates really were and who could really know, um, you know, the rates that were in place between a provider and a payer. It was a big deal. It was a big black box in, in the United States. And that black box has been burst. Um, and so we are literally in unprecedented times when it comes to the availability of this data. Um, and everybody should be using it to their advantage for sure. Uh, the, the, the second learning objective is connecting this uh, this data um, to your um, service line performance. I, I think every hospital in the country is evaluating uh, whether or not all of their service lines are worth keeping, uh, worth expanding, worth shrinking, et cetera, right? So that's, uh, our, you know, it's an important point of view we have is to leverage this, these uh, price transparency data into that, um, into that realm. And then, and then finally kind of bringing the two together. Um, and uh, I think Heather will be uh, helping us kind of connect the two um, uh, into the, the one integrated approach and, and we'll bring it home from there. So, um, so that's the learning objectives and I'm going to hand it over to Michelle Ray, who's going to kick us off with some background information. We've got four polling questions today, guys, please respond to those polling questions so you can get your CPE credit, but Michelle, go ahead. Sure. Thanks, David. Good afternoon, everybody. I, I appreciate you joining the webinar. Uh, as David said, um, we're going to talk today about the regulations, the challenges, and the value of transparency data and its value with service line analysis. So I wanted to start with what, you know, a typical overview of transparency and coverage. So transparency and coverage was enacted by CMS in November of 2020. Um, the requirements were for hospital and health plans. Uh, but basically the reason around it was to provide access 
user-friendly access to consumers regarding price transparency, cost of services, in advance of receiving those services. Um, it kind of ties into the No Surprises Act also, which provides some level of transparency to consumers also. So there was two major components or tools that are part of this uh, rule. And one is implementing a shoppable services tool, which is a tool that would be available on hospital and health plan websites, which acts as a comparison tool. And the other one was MRF data or machine readable files. And the machine readable files, I'm sure many of you are probably familiar somewhat uh, with them, uh, has presented some challenges in terms of extracting the data. And we're gonna talk about those challenges today um, and ways to mitigate them and also um, ways in which you could utilize them to do some benchmarking as David said. So we'll go into more details. We have some slides on challenges on format um, and what the transparency file data can do for you moving forward. David? Yeah. Yeah, so we our first polling question, um, just a heads up again, need to, need to ask everybody on the line to, to respond to all of these as quickly as possible. You'll see it pop up on your screen here momentarily if you haven't already. So first polling question, has your organization used MRF data in competitive reimbursement analyses? That is the primary use case around the country. Um, and we're just asking you, uh, have you done so, right? So the response is not yet, no plans. Uh, B is not yet in a meaningful way, but we do plan to in the future. Uh, or yes, we've started to review rates. That's response C. Uh, or yes, you know we're, we're pros at using the MRF data. I, I'm going to be very interested to see how many responses we get for D. Um, and then you can always uh, use uh, you know E not applicable. But if you could go ahead and please respond uh, to that, we will um, share the results in probably about uh, two minutes or less with you. But in the meantime, we'll, we'll proceed on to the next slide and then again, come back to me for results when they're available. No, Michelle? Right. Yep. yep, thanks. Um, so how to access price transparency data. So the requirement is that price transparency data is available on hospital and health plan websites. Um, oftentimes you have to do a little searching for it, but it is, it is out there. Also a shoppable service engine is out there. Um, initially, there was a requirement where not all services needed to be included, for example, in the shoppable service tool. That is, that is I believe, changing soon. Um, the machine readable file is out there, uh, generally in a JSON format. I will tell you though, um, Baker Tilly has done a lot of work on the transparency files and there are other formats out there. Uh, for example, I've seen it in Excel, uh, which is more user friendly, obviously. Uh, so we're going to talk about those requirements and um, ways to access them. So next slide. I think so goals of the of transparency file and what it's going to do for you. Obviously, it's going to drive down the cost of healthcare. care. Um, price transparency has definitely increased competition in the in the environment. Uh, initially, even though it's really focused on consumer friendliness and access, uh, it's really it's, it's also being accessed by providers and health plans alike. Uh, so it's a great tool to check out, you know, where you are, the provider, in terms of other providers in the area. It also is accessible for members. Members can actually uh, search for prices prior to receiving services that definitely would uh, affect th the cost of health care and also drive competition. Uh, a member or a potential member may see a price that's much you know, lower for one provider and that could affect the patient base and the volume of services. Um, also too, it's a tool that definitely we're seeing more and more, including ourselves, used by researchers, vendors, uh, analysts to really dive into the data. The data is in a, it, data is in a format that's ingestible and um, can be brought into databases and analyzed and accessed um, and really get down to the level 
of individual CPT codes, service codes, and we'll talk more about the service lines, but it's definitely very valuable um, and something that really can be used for providers in terms of benchmarking and negotiations with health plans. Next slide. And, and Michelle, I, I I do have the, the results of the first polling question, so okay. sorry to, sorry to break your momentum, but... Um, you know, so at the summary level, about 20 percent of you, about one in five of you, um, you know, are, are saying that you have leveraged, uh, you, you know, the MRF files um, uh, and, and have conducted compliance reviews of, of, of your MRF files. So um, there's another significant chunk that knows they haven't done that that compliance check. And then there's um, a bunch that aren't sure. Right. But I but, you know, the, I guess the. The news headline here is, is that um, about one in five um, have done a compliance check. Um, and so that's lower than we would anticipate. And, and, and we, we do recommend that while CMS is not out there uh, finding people left and right, you know, we, we do think it's just prudent to, you know, to certainly um, make sure that your files are compliant and formats are changing almost annually um, with new CMS guidelines. So it's a it's a prudent thing to do. But one in five um, are, are saying they've done a compliance check. Uh, the rest either aren't sure or haven't done it. So, yeah, I, I, that's a good point. We do have a slide. I, I don't want to skip ahead, but probably after this one on compliance. So as many of you probably know, CMS has started doing um, random reviews of hospital websites to see if the MRF meets the requirements, if it's even out there the naming convention, the file specs. And to date, over 700 hospitals, I believe, have been uh, given notices over the last couple of years on non-compliance issues. Some have been issued corrective action plans and others are um, actually fined and penalties. And the penalties are quite high. You know, they recently increased them. So it ranges from, um, I believe, $5,000 to almost a million dollars. So it's really a significant penalty and compliance is really important. And what we've seen is, you know, throughout the industry, an increase in the request for an MRF assessment and the need to do that. And as David mentioned, uh, there is a plan for the CMS file formats to change over the next few months, if that's still going to go through. Um, and so it's really, it's very important um, from a compliance standpoint, that everybody takes a look at their files, uh, because I believe the latest data was about 70% of hospitals that were reviewed were compliant, but that's not reviewing every hospital. That's, you know, whatever their process is in terms of randomly selecting. Um, so I think everybody should keep that in mind. Um, my uh, colleague, Kevin, is going to talk about some of the challenges in detail that we've seen with the data. Um, just to give you a you know, preview, it's between you know, not being complete, having duplicate uh, services with different rates. So there, there's a lot of challenges and assessments, I think, are very important. So anyway, let me just back up. I, I thought I'd segue into that, David, since you brought up compliance. Um, so, so let's talk about provider and payer MRFs. So the, the file specs for the MRFs for provider and payer now are a bit different, right? Um, some, are, some are easier to work with than others. So there are differences there. Another difference in the MRF files is the timing. So payers, I believe, need to update their file on a monthly basis. Providers, meaning hospitals, don't need to do it that often. So you need to keep in mind if there's a difference in rates, which they should be, theoretically be the same or close, um, that could be a reason. Also, too, on some of the files, the number of services, you know, the requirement was 300. They're moving now to have all services in the file. And then also just the accessibility of the file um, and how easy it is on each of the websites, whether it's the payer or the provider, differs. Um, so there's definitely inconsistency on both sides. Um, but those are just some, you know some of our observations. 
Next slide. So we touched on this a little bit, but let's go into more detail. Benchmarking reimbursement rates with competitors. So, so what can this transparency data do for us? Well, it, it's probably not the only component in benchmarking, but it's a complement, a supplement to typical benchmarking activities. For example, the, the benchmarking that we do at Baker Tilly. And you know, what we're finding is more and more um, clients are asking to incorporate transparency rates into benchmarking activities. And, you know, our assessment at this point is there's definitely a value to that uh, because oftentimes the MRF is not very ingestible and we can definitely, uh, you know, help with that. Um, provides valuable information in the contract negotiation process. I mean, this is really important um, in terms of if, you, the provider, or you, the payer, are thinking of expanding your service area or your market and want to see what's out there and what the rates are. Um, network development activities, if you need to expand your network in certain areas or work with certain specialties, you can gauge that. Um, optimizes profitability. Well, service line analysis, we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But, you know, while the MRF um, is not necessarily organized specifically by service line, the data is there. So um, you know, that's definitely one of, um, one of the ways to analyze it. And then we also will talk about that with Heather in a little while. Um, this is really important. I, I'm a very uh, big pro when it comes to um, patient and member satisfaction through empowerment. Uh, this is definitely going to have an impact on patient satisfaction, knowing up front what the fees are, what the costs are prior to making appointments or prior, prior to getting the services. And this is real, a really important piece. And I don't think it should be discounted at all. And then strengthening relationships with the providers and payers. So, you know, as David said, like the best kept secret were these rates for years. Um, and now they're out there. And I think that's only going to improve relationships with the providers and payers because transparency drives trust. And it, it just makes sense that uh, moving forward, they'll, you know, they'll have better and more productive negotiations. Next slide. OK, so this is what I talked about that I jumped to. Uh, again, compliance considerations and where we are in terms of the hospital side. To date, we haven't seen it on the health plan side. I would suspect that that will be coming down the pike, but I think this is really, really important to take a look at and consider um, MRF assessments and compliance and, and timing of the files. It's really important. Next. David. Okay. Okay. So um, polling question number two, um, although I, I apologize, I'm a little confused. I thought we were, we, we flipped them. Um, but I, cause I think we already responded to this compliance question. Correct. Event coordinator. Um, so I, I you know, de depending upon which, um, you know, which, question you have up in front of you, because uh, I'm not getting feedback from the event coordinator. Uh, if it if it is the competitive reimbursement analysis, has your organization used MRF data um, in a competitive analysis? Um, please respond. Um, there we go. So um, so here here are the response options, because the the first question you responded to had to do with compliance. And, and we commented on those results, the one in five. Now, this is uh, has your organization used the MRF data in a competitive reimbursement analysis. You can see the options here. Not yet, no plans to do so, um, which we don't recommend. Uh, B, not yet in a meaningful way, but we plan to. Or C, we've started. Uh, or D, we we are pros at using the data. And of course, um, E, not applicable. So, uh, you know, apologize for a brief confusion here, but I think we've, um, you know, effectively swapped the, the first two questions here, and we're going to get you feedback on on this competitive reimbursement question here, um, you know, shortly. But we'll uh, we'll continue with the content um, and then come back to you with the results. 
Hi, all. So my name is Kevin Coonan. Um, David introduced me earlier. Um, I spend most of my time working with uh, health plans, payers. Um, most, of my, most of my work with payers is in the network management space. Um, and network management has had a lot of challenges in the last uh, couple of years with uh, transparency and coverage, the Surprises Act, um, et cetera. And then, you know, of course, a normally complicated, complicated market um, managing provider networks. Um, and so I wanted to talk a bit about some of the challenges with, with these uh, machine readable files, um, both for payers and providers, anyone trying to use, trying to use this data. So maybe let's, let's, let's talk through a few of these. Um, and, and, and maybe first, as David said, you know, network rates between providers and payers for the longest time, you know, were sacrosanct. Like you yep. didn't, we didn't, we didn't talk about them. They were, they were business confidential information. Mm -hmm. um, and there were companies, there were, there were providers, there were health plans running all sorts of analysis, like coordination of benefits analysis to try to, you know, figure out what the rates are for, for their competitors. And then along comes transparency. And now we have, we have in theory, and we'll talk about why that's in theory, but in practice, it can be more difficult, you know, access to all of this, you know, competitive information that no one ever had before. Um, but the nature of, of this information is that it, it can be challenging to use. And so we're going to talk in the next, in the, in the next couple of slides here, um, you know, how, 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 how the nature of these files makes it still difficult to use it, but, but we we all have no choice. We we need to try to use the information as best we can, and and navigate some of the challenges. So you know the first challenge is the the data the data sets are huge. Um, they're they're JSON files, so they're they're in a kind of a machine readable format that's not very useful to humans. Um, and 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 so and so it's important to be able to you know parse these files. Um, and in order to be able to use, um, you know, use the the data within it in a, in a way that's meaningful, um, each payer and and let's talk payer for a second. Payer files, like on if you go to the United Healthcare website, there's fifty thousand different files that are published. Each one of those is is, is can be multiple gigabytes in size. There's index files, you know, that explain how to use how to use these files, but we're talking about terabytes of of data in in, in fairly you know complex formats that um, you know in order to get at the data, um, we've got in network files, we've got out of network files, we've got um, bundled rate files. There's so so being able to read this data in a in a meaningful way can be difficult, you know, if you don't have access to an aggregator or you don't have an analytics team, you know, to be able to ingest the data, as well. I mean, just think about the sheer amount of data. So, so let's take a let's take a health plan um, who's got a national account. We, we're now producing. So, so let's back up. The 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 payers, the health plans, are producing uh, MRF files on behalf of all of their self-funded accounts. If those self-funded accounts are national, that means that each um, self-funded MRF contains rates for all networks across all providers potentially nationwide that are in you know all of their all of their networks so millions of providers times multiple networks we were talking huge huge amounts of data that that need to be kind of turned into something useful on the on the second column here on the hospital mrfs the data sizes are 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 much more manageable but 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 the um, the challenge here is in there are still gaps in provider compliance. There's still hospitals that are not producing um, files on a regular basis, or they're not producing files that contain cons information in a consistent format that makes it that is either complete or consistent in a way that it, the data is usable. Um, as as uh, Michelle mentioned earlier, there is CMS is um, you know, is enforcing the, you know, compliance more, um, but we're still seeing gaps. 
And in fact, when this rolled out, it was something like only 20% of hospitals were complying with GUI, if, if even that. And it, mm -hmm. and it still hasn't caught up to 100%. Um, and we also have only hospital data, right? Not not necessarily outpatient centers, not not professionals. So um, so we've got data, we've got data, but we've got challenges. Okay, the next two columns we're going to talk about in a little bit more detail in, in following slides. But the but the but the first the, the column number three here, the blue bar in the middle. Um, even if we are able to pull all of the data out of these huge data sets it's still not gonna get us a complete picture. And we'll explain why. The MRF is not sophisticated enough to store all of the reimbursement terms that, 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 that um, network contracts often have. In some cases, it, it does. In many cases, it doesn't. So there are pitfalls and landmines when trying to use this data um, you know, for competitive analysis because we're dealing with an incomplete data set. And then column four, just because we have the data doesn't mean that we don't need to, to apply some analytics and some understanding of how network reimbursement works in order to compare multiple providers you know, across one payer or multiple payers across one provider. It's not a plug in, plug in and here we go. There's, there's, some, there's some work to do to, ma to make apples to apples comparisons. We'll talk a little more about that. And then lastly, and, and I think this is probably obvious, but the data lacks context, right? This is only fee-for-service data. We don't have quality scores. We don't have outcomes data. We don't have, um, there's no information other than rates. So rates is the only thing that, you know, that we're getting out of this, not not the, the nature of how the networks are constructed, the narrowness, the, the nature of the benefit plan isn't, isn't fully supplied here. So mainly we're talking about rates for me. Let's move to the next slide, please. So, so let's talk about what in, incomplete reimbursement picture means. So I've got three three kind of vignettes here of, of, an, of, an, of an outpatient contract, an inpatient contract, and a professional fee schedule. So in the upper left, um, let's say we've got an outpatient schedule, and we say this this may or may not pertain to some, some of the contracts that you know, for, for, for provider organizations that are on the call. Um, but we've seen these in, in various payers and, and providers. Um, oftentimes there is a not to exceed um, term. So we might say, all right, we'll pay, you know, $3,000 per case, not to exceed 80% of charges, or we'll not, we'll not pay more than $600 or 80% of charges if it's not a surgery. Sometimes there are surgeries on ER claims, um, for example. And so there's logic that says, oh, if there's a surgery, pay the surgery always first, not the ER. So the MRF, it loses some context. Number one, the lesser of doesn't appear. It, it can appear, the 80% is can appear if in certain cases in the MRF, but oftentimes we see that the that the payers will, will supply the the, the case rate without the percentage. Um, and so we will lose the, the lesser of. Now, how meaningful is that? Um, it depends on the nature of the, of the charge master of whatever provider the network agreement pertains to, but you are losing a bit of information if you were to use it, say, in a contract negotiation, you, you're missing a bit of information. Um, second, it doesn't tell you if you see an ER and a surgery, if that condition were to occur, pay the surgery, not the ER. Now, maybe standard practice is that surgery pays over ER, but that's not always the case. We've seen payers where the opposite is true. Um, it's not as common, but it does happen. So it's hard to know the, the hierarchical nature of reimbursement, you know, can be, um, you know, can be, can be impactful. Let's talk inpatient for a second. Oftentimes, not as common as probably used to be, but there are per diem contracts still in existence. Per diem contracts often have carve outs. So we'll pay 4,000 per diem, but for certain surgeries uh, or certain procedures, either denoted by ICD codes or, or DRG codes, we'll pay a, a, a carve out rate. So in many cases, payers will say, I 
like I, I'm choosing to only put the per diem because the per diem covers all of my rates, not the DRG. The DRG in some ways is not mutually exclusive to the per diem because again, there's a hierarchical relationship. So when you look at an MRF, you may see here's revenue codes, here's the per diem rate, but you will miss some of the, the you know, the OB in this case, or the spinal fusion, which if a claim were to, if you were to compare, be, you know, the, you know, between different providers or payers, you'll lose some of the under or over payments or under um, the payment differences based on those particular services. So again, use with care. On the professional fee schedule, this is generally more straightforward. Usually professional fee schedules are CPT with a rate. That's not always the case. Sometimes, especially for new rates, we'll see percent of charge if if if, if CMS or, or if um, if a new CPT code is released and CMS oftentimes even commercial rates are subject to um, you know what does CMS pay? Sometimes CMS doesn't have a rate yet, so we'll we'll plug in a percent of charge until a rate you know appears. Um, so we've got some percent of charge, you know, complications as well. There's some adjustments that payers make like multi-surgery discounts or different classes of providers creating discounts. Um, and those often are shown in MRF as well. So the MRF is pretty good, but it's not, um, but it's not a slam dunk in certain cases. And it's hard to know if you're getting the whole picture or not. Hey, hey, Kevin, can I just uh, interject on the, yeah. uh, the the poll results? So, um, so on on the on the question of um, you know your organization using the MRF data uh, to your advantage from a, um, a commercial reimbursement analysis standpoint, um, twenty five percent of you have no plans uh, you know to use it in that way, which is interesting. Um, half of you, fifty percent of you, do have plans but haven't yet pulled the trigger. Um, another 20% are actually engaged in, in competitive analysis using the MRF files. And then there's 5% of you um, that consider yourselves pros uh, at using uh, the MRF data uh, to your advantage. So, um, you know, kudos, uh, you know, to the self-proclaimed pros out there. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, you know, it's, it's certainly our recommendation um, that uh, this heretofore unavailable data, um, you know, get into your analytics shop um, in, in some sort of meaningful way. But that's how the, uh, the responses are, are peeling off on that, that question of using the MRF effectively. So I hope we didn't confuse the audience. The first survey was about compliance and about one in five of you, um, you know, have, have thought about compliance in a meaningful way. This is more about using the data um, in a competitive, meaningful way. Uh, and about half of you plan on doing it, and about 5% of you consi are, consider yourselves pros at using the data um, in a meaningful way um, competitively. So so just, Kevin, I'll, I'll get out of the way again, but just kind of wanted to catch up the group on the uh, the polling. No, that's well-timed and, and in interesting results. Yeah, yep. So we talked a little about MRF isn't perfect, right? It's not sophisticated enough to, to provide you with a fully complete picture, right? You're you're working. You're you're trying to uh, understand what are my competitors being paid, um, and or or what are my competitors paying, um, but 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 you're working without without an, a full deck. You got you got most a lot of information, not everything. Um, some is better than others, but let's also talk. Let when you do get the information and 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 you make some assessment of, you know what you know, what, the, how reliable that is. Now we have to do some work in comparing rates to one another, right? So what we're striving for here, and, and again, this isn't, this is not a brand new concept in, in benchmarking that's been around using other methods, but when we get, when we get rates like this that we're comparing together, we're really trying to look for direct apples to apples reimbursement comparisons. The better, the, if, if, if a payer or a provider want to use this data in a contract negotiation or to benchmark themselves, you want to make sure that you've got, um, you know, that you've got something that you can hang your hat on, right? So you're trying to match networks with similar characteristics, e.g., a broad PPO to a PPO, so one area to another area. You're trying, and then we're trying, um, 
we're trying to find close matches and we'll, we'll talk down below, you know, if we can get if this is an inpatient example, if we can get a DRG to a DRG, that's fantastic. Because then we can say, all right, payer A's got a DRG contract, payer B's got a DRG contract. We can know, all right, payer A, we can, we can back in to, looks like this payer is paying a, a $10,000 case rate or base payment rate on DRGs. Payer B looks like an $8,500 base payment rate. That's really useful information and it's directly comparable. Now, oftentimes the MRFs do not pay DRG outlier clauses, but there's 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 usually rules of thumb around how outliers work. That I think the payer A and payer B were getting getting pretty pretty close to being able to apples to apples match up. Percent of charge. If we get a percent of charge and a percent of charge with the same provider, hospital one two three, we can pretty much say, all right, payer A is paying more than payer B. That's pretty close. But it's when we get different reimbursement methods that we we either need to filter those and not use them or normalize them in some way. For example, maybe we've got a DRG payment and a per diem payment. How do we normalize those? We might say, okay, DRG one, two, three pays 24,000 and payer B pays 4,000 per diem, but the average length of stay is five days. So we assume that the average payment would be 20,000. So we're doing some normalization to make comparisons. There's also cases like DRG to percent of charge. Boy, this gets harder, right? Now we're taking DRG one, two, three at 24,000. But now we have to mock up uh, what we what we estimate to be a typical DRG set of services using the particular you know, provider's charges in order to calculate what you know what the total payment would be. We're going through some a fair degree of you know derivation that becomes a little harder to defend if we're using this in a negotiating, you know, at the negotiating table. So, so we're always looking for direct, um, you know, direct comparisons and each service category, as we talked about before is a little different. Professionals tend to be the most straightforward, um, but outpatient can have a mix of, you know, case rates, percent of charge, APCs, Medicare based payments, et cetera. Uh, inpatient can have a mix of payments as well. So we're, you know, we want, we want to try to make sure we're, we're taking the Rubik's cube and putting it together you know, in the right way um, to compare certain pairs to, you know, certain providers and pairs together that, you know, make the most sense. So there are methods, there's really good data here, taking care and, and making sure to, to get apples to apples is, is important. Yeah, Kevin, we got, we got several questions on how comparable is the data across providers? And I think you just nailed it, right? That, um, you know, that is the fundamental challenge. Um, with using this data for competitive intelligence is uh, getting that apples to apples comparison that you just reviewed. So we got we got several questions on that front and uh, you just proactively nailed it. Um, okay, um, third, uh, third polling question. What have been your organization's largest challenges in use of the MRF data? Now, some of you may not be using it, but for those of you that are using the data in some way, shape or fashion, um, uh, and appreciate a response from everybody, a, having time resources to start looking into it, that's your biggest challenge. B, gaining access to the data in, in a usable way. Or C, drawing actionable conclusions from the MRF data, which is likely connected to what Kevin just reviewed, which is how do you make this stuff apples to apples, right? So that, um, I, I don't want to speculate too much in why you're responding C, but that's that's one of the reasons why you might respond C. And then, of course, not applicable D. So if you guys could go ahead and respond to polling question Number three, we promise that this is the right polling question for the right responses, and uh, we'll keep moving forward. Two, two other answers to questions because they've been coming in fast and furious in addition to the comparability. Freestanding ambulatory surgery centers are not typically in these files. Now, hospital-based ambulatory surgery um, cases are, but freestanding entities, um, and, and you can debate the definition of freestanding, but typically, no. Uh, they, they are not in there. Um, and then lastly, hospitals are supposed to update these files um, annually. I believe, Kevin, payers have a, an obligation that's more frequent in, in terms of updating of, of these files. Is that correct, Kevin? So, so maybe two, two notes. Uh, payers are required to publish files monthly. Monthly, okay. Um, and, and payers are also required to publish any of their provider networks, which include 
ASCs and, and, and freestanding, yes. as long as there's an in-network contract with them. And then they also have an out-of-network um, you know, file as well. So pay, payers are more comprehensive. Pay, payers are more comprehensive. I, I Just to clarify my comment, the, the freestanding ambulatory surgery is not in the provider files, but Kevin is right on that they are in the payer files. The payer files are the more comprehensive of the two, hands down. Um, and they also get updated more frequently, as Kevin just outlined. So just to address some of the uh, the questions as we keep uh, keep moving forward here. So the, 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 um, the payers don't, of course, include provider charges, um, which provider files do include. So you've got, you got a little extra information in provider files on that front. True. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Great. Um, so as we spoke a lot about price transparency files, I want to pivot the conversation a little bit um, over to service line analytics. Um, so first, I want to break down some of the barriers to financial sustainability and kind of tracking, monitoring your own financial health within your organization. Um, Margins have stabilized a little bit over the past year, however, um, are still far below historical averages. Providers often find themselves in a position where they really need to ask themselves a series of questions related to the financial health of their service lines. Um, first and foremost, which of my service lines are performing appropriately? Which of them have um, you know, positive margins, where are areas where I'm underperforming, whether that's I, I have a reimbursement issue that I'm aware of, I have a um, cost issue that, that I may want to look at improving, or maybe it's a situation where your service lines are performing, but um, you know you can get better outcomes um, when looking at market averages, et cetera. So a lot of the challenge stems from, do I have the service line analytics using my own data, my own sources to understand where I'm performing? Um, do I know where I might be able to tighten expenses further? Do I know where I might be able to negotiate a better rate? Um, and can I ultimately get at the data that I need to make informed business decisions? Um, so if you're in a position where you have service line analytics, that's, that's great. Um, how reliable are those analytics when you're having conversations with stakeholders and they're asking questions about service line performance, are you able to answer those questions and using the methods that you have available to pull together service line analytics are, um, people able to trust it? If, if you are at a stakeholder conversation and there's a lot of questions about, wait, t tell me how you came up with this report or I've never seen this report before, help orient me, um, that might be a sign that it's time to think about more robust service line analytics. Um, and you know, really you may have an opportunity to um, move the conversation beyond how did I get to these results to okay, we're all sitting around the table. Um, we all understand that we have an opportunity here. Now, what are the steps that we want to take as an organization to um, pursue that opportunity, whether that's on the cost side, whether that's on the reimbursement side? Um, having data that's available, transparent, um, and that can help drive decision-making is really important. Um, I want to talk through a couple of examples where um, we've worked with organizations that have been able to successfully implement service line analytics, just as some um, ways to think about how you may be able to optimize your own service line analytics insights. Um, we were working with an organization in the past where they made the decision to move from more ad hoc analytic request based service line analytics where they were grabbing a couple different data sets, a couple different systems to try and answer questions that would come up from their stakeholders across um, different types of service lines. 
um, where they wanted to make the investment to consolidate all service line analytics into a single solution that would be able to pull data from the various disparate data sources that they had so that they could start answering questions more quickly um, in a more consolidated format so that the stakeholders they produced insights for were able to get more timely analytics as, cons as well as consistent um, looking analytics to help drive some of those change opportunity conversations. Um, once they made this investment, a couple of the service lines and, and especially orthopedics as a service line that they were able to look at was related to how how is my orthopedic service line at large performing? I They, they were able to see that the average cost per case was higher than they had expected um, and they wanted to know why. So their analytics solution was able to pretty quickly drill down into um, lower green than just that high level service line. And they were able to compare some of their the, the doctor peers against one another. And what they ultimately um, identified is that one of their doctors was using a um, knee implant that was not compatible with one of their uh, mega robots, which was driving up costs for um, those cases. And it was also having an impact on length of stays and patient outcomes. So through these service line analytics, they were able to have a conversation with the orthopedics team, identify ways that they might be able to change some behaviors to be able to ultimately get those costs more under control in areas that they would like to see them in. Um, a second example of this is actually insights that um, a client of ours without service line analytics and reliable monitoring on service line analytics didn't even realize they had a problem in. So women's health, um, they this client invested in a consolidated service line analytics solution and pretty quickly realized that there were a number of DRG downgrades within their women's health service line that they hadn't previously been exposed to prior to the um, more regular monitoring of the service line analytics they were doing. So almost immediately, they were able to identify that the DRG downgrades were an issue in the service line, have conversations with their team members to be able to change some of the practices to um, avoid some of these downgrades that they, they were experiencing and didn't really realize. Um, a third example that I want to share today is related to general surgery. Um, one of the things that a client of ours was doing in their service line analytics was reviewing um, really across the board different service lines and how, um, how much expected reimbursement compared to actual reimbursement was coming in. And for general surgery, they realized month over month, there were a lot of additional claims coming in um, that they, they didn't necessarily expect. And once they drilled in a little bit further, they realized that um, their time to bill for general surgery claims was much longer than they expected it to be. So again, this is an example where a client was able to um, quickly get at that information, look at the trends, drill into the detail within their service line analytics, and understand that, hey, we have an issue here. Let's work with our medical staff to see if we can get that time to bill um, decreased so that we can start seeing that revenue come in um, sooner. So I think long short, it's incredibly important to have data and access to service line information that you can review that um, team members trust and that you can review um, over time, it's not really a once and done approach so much as a, how do we make sure we are optimizing the financial health across our service lines um, frequently so that we can make some business decisions related to which service lines are working for us today, which service lines really do need some improvement. Um, and then, you know, are there any tough decisions that we need to think about making? So as we, Think about service line analytics and in context of price transparency, there's a couple of key um, points that I want to make here. The first is um, just an organization's own service line performance and analysis of 
that performance is going to remain a crucial step in understanding um, where to start conversations with payers, for example. Um, as my colleagues mentioned earlier, there are price transparency files, and these are increasingly being used for competitive intelligence, but they're not natively at a service line level. So if you are going to overlay price transparency on top of service line analytics, you need to think about how are there ways that you can roll up the individual information within the price transparency files to be able to talk apples to apples within the context of a service line in your own performance. Um, and then last, but certainly not least, but as Kevin mentioned earlier, there's additional, um, I'd say caveats or challenges that need to be considered when looking at price transparency files in general, and then trying to translate those to your own service line analytics. With that said, I am going to pass it back to David to kind of um, wrap us up here. Okay, I feel like I'm spinning about six plates on my on my fingers and toes right now, but uh, we'll 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 get through this. Um, so thank you very much, Heather. That was uh, that was great. So thank thanks to all three of you for uh, um, you know for contributing. So we're in the home stretch. Uh, you know, I'm I'm going to hit some takeaways here in a minute, but I you know question three of the polling. Uh, if you're dying to know what the results of that question was. Um, What's your biggest MRF challenge? 50% of you said the time to get to it. Um, and so that's interesting. Half of you are saying it's simply a time issue uh, in terms of getting to those files. 30% of you say it's access to the files that's an issue. So that, that might be some sort of technical issue or maybe it's kind of a, an interpretation issue that it's hard to interpret what you're accessing. Um, and then 20% of you uh, say you're having trouble getting actionable insights out of the files, right? Which circles back to all three of my colleagues' comments around getting to apples to apples comparisons and 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 creating the right unit of analysis. Um, in, in this case, we're talking about service line today, right? To get you to a point where you can actually have actionable insights like the things that Heather, uh, you know, just rattled off, right? So interesting poll results on that on that polling question. Number three, um, you know, the, the the key takeaways as we try to land this plane and see if there's any, you know, um, kind of final questions. Um, you know, we 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 really feel strongly that uh, this this data is should be treated like gold uh, in the sense that, you know, um, if you're younger, you probably didn't realize that how much of a black box this has been for the past half century. Um, and now there's sunshine all over this information. Um, and. Uh, you should be leveraging it um, in, in meaningful ways, not just competitively, uh, but also to understand your own service line mechanics, right? So th those are the two big use cases that we tried to present to you today. And I guess that's the, the, key, the key summary takeaway is use this data um, and, and use it for two use cases that we put in front of you uh, today. Um, the second bullet, the, the thing that I'll highlight that's somewhat unique to, to what Heather's summary was is uh, charges. You know, rates are one thing. Um, charges oftentimes get sloughed off as meaningless, but but charges are still something that consumers see, et cetera, right? And and charges vary a lot by region. They vary a lot by hospital. Um, and as Kevin pointed out, the provider files do have charges in there as well as contracted rates. And you should really be looking at both because if your charges are an outlier, Maybe your rates aren't an outlier, but if your charges are an outlier, there's a possibility that there's consumers that are accessing those charges um, and steering away from you because your charges are an outlier, right? So that's a possibility, right? It's not a given, but it's possible. And so we just highlight that too, that it's the contracted rates are really the gold that I refer to because charges have typically been more in the public domain, but it still doesn't hurt you know, to make sure that you're comparing your charges, you know, to, to other charges for sure. Um, and, you know, the, the last bullet there is, is certainly bringing it all together. Um, you know, having having competitive, um, you know, rates and, and, and using that in a, in a meaningful way uh, and then bringing it into a service line level, which does require utilization data um, for sure. And so, you know, certainly there are third parties like Baker Tilly um, that do have like, you know, utilization data for cardiac service lines, for orthopedic service lines, right, for for hospitals in your geographic area. 
um, if you need to, you know, to do these kinds of analyses, we, we do recognize that um, there are some inputs that aren't necessarily in the files that are needed to get this done, um, but it's eminently doable. And, and that's, I think, the message we wanted to try to send here today, uh, if that's if there's one takeaway that you guys will will get from today. So um, so next slide, I think we have one more polling question um, and then we'll we'll land the plane. And and I think we tried to respond to the questions were coming fast and furious there for a little while. I'm seeing that we're uh, don't have new questions yet, but we'll see. Um, so our last polling question, are you interested in a demo of our service line data science analytics solution for healthcare providers? Uh, Baker Tilly, in case you missed it, um, I, I think it was referenced a couple times. Uh, we do have a, um, a, a data science tool that, that can facilitate some of the things that mostly Heather was talking about. So uh, if you uh, are interested, respond A. Uh, if you're maybe interested, respond B. Um, if you're definitely not interested, say no, thank you, um, which is C or, or not applicable, right? So we, so if you could, if you could just, uh, you know, kind of do the final act of, of, of this webinar in order to get your CPE credits. Um, I don't know that every, the audience is dying to know what the results are of this, of this final polling question for, but I, but, but certainly uh, want to thank everybody for uh, their attention today. Um, and um, I'm not seeing any additional questions, but, but certainly, I think we provided our contact information at the top of the hour. Um, you know, here is a, a QR code, um, you know, that should uh, highlight some appropriate um, information for sure. Um, and uh, we look forward to having you in, in additional webinars going forward. Um, and Heather, check me on the date. I, I do believe we have a seminar, um, you know, coming up for our data science, our service line data science tool. And I believe that's coming up in roughly about two weeks, Heather. Yes. October 31st, Halloween. All right. So on, on Halloween, trick or treat, um, you know, we've uh, we've got a seminar, uh, which is basically a remote or virtual um, demo uh, of our data science tool for those of you that might be interested. So if you responded, yes, we know who you are and we'll get you an invite. Make sure that you have an invite to that uh, to that session. So um, so with that, I guess I'm going to thank you one last time for, for joining today. Hopefully we imparted some interesting knowledge on you um, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.